The Best Christmas Pageant Ever by Barbara Robinson. Chapter 6 Our last rehearsal happened to be the night before the potluck supper, and when we got there the kitchen was full of ladies in aprons, counting out dishes and silverware and making applesauce cake for the dessert. I'm sorry about this, one of the ladies told Mother, but with so much to do at this time of year, the committee decided to come in this evening and set up the tables and all. I just hope we won't bother you. Oh, you won't, Mother said. We won't be in the kitchen. You won't even know we're here. Mother was wrong. Everybody in that end of town knew we were there before the evening was over. Now, this is going to be a dress rehearsal, Mother told us all. And right away, three or four baby angels began hollering that they forgot their wings. Half the angel choir had forgotten their robes, and Hobie Carmichael said he didn't have any kind of a costume. Wear your father's bathrobe, Charlie told him. That's what I do. He doesn't have a bathrobe. What does he hang around the house in? His underwear, Hobie said. I looked at Alice Wendelkin to see if she was going to write that down on her pad of paper. But Alice was standing all by herself in a corner, patting her hair. Her hair was all washed and curled, and her robe was clean and pressed. She had even put Vaseline on her eyelids, so they would shine in the candlelight, and everyone would say, Who is that lovely girl in the angel choir? Why isn't she merry? I guess Alice was afraid to move for fear she might spoil herself. Don't worry about your wings, Mother said. The main point of a dress rehearsal isn't the costumes. The main point is to go right straight through without stopping. And that's what we're going to do, just as if we were doing it for the whole congregation. I'm going to sit in the back of the church and be the audience. But it didn't work that way. The baby angels came in at the wrong place and had to go back out again. And the, a whole gang of shepherds didn't come in at all for fear of Gladys. Imogene couldn't find the baby Jesus doll and wrapped up a great big memorial flower urn in the blanket and then dropped it on Ralph's foot. And half the angel choir sang away in a manger while the other half sang O Little Town of Bethlehem. So we had to start over a lot. I've got the baby here, Imogene barked at the wise men. Don't touch him. I named him Jesus. No, no, no. Mother came flying up the aisle. Now, Imogene, you know you're not supposed to say anything. Nobody says anything in our pageant except the angel of the Lord and the choir singing carols. Mary and Joseph and the wise men make a lovely picture for us to look at while we think about Christmas and what it means. I guess Mother had to say things like that, even though everybody knew it was a big lie. The Herdmans didn't look like anything out of the Bible, more like trick or treat. Imogene even had on great big gold earrings, and she wouldn't take them off. Now, Imogene, Mother said, you know Mary didn't wear earrings. I have to wear these, Imogene said. Why is that? I got my ears pierced, and if I don't keep something in them, they'll grow together. Well, they won't grow together in an hour and a half, Mother said. No, but I better leave them in. Imogene pulled on her earrings, which made you shudder. It was like looking at the pictures in National Geographic of natives with their ears stretched all the way to their shoulders. What did the doctor say about leaving something in them? Mother said. What doctor? Well, who pierced your ears? Gladys, Imogene said. That really made you shudder. The thought of Gladys Herdman piercing ears. I thought she probably used an ice pick. And for the next six months, I kept watching Imogene to see her ears turn black and fall off. All right, Mother said, but we'll try to find something smaller and more appropriate for you to wear in the pageant. 
Now we'll start again and go right straight through. And I think I ought to tell them what his name is, Imogene said. No, besides, you remember it wasn't Mary who named the baby. I told you, Ralph whacked Imogene on the back. I named him. Joseph didn't name the baby either, Mother said. God sent an angel to tell Mary what his name should be. Imogene sniffed. I would have named him Bill. Alice Wendelkin sucked in her breath, and I could hear her scratching down on her pad of paper that Imogene Herdman would have called the baby Bill instead of Jesus. What angel was that? Ralph wanted to know. Was that Gladys? No, Mother said. Gladys is the angel who comes to the shepherds with the news. Yeah, Gladys said. Unto you a child is born, she yelled at the shepherds. Unto me, Imogene yelled back at her. Not them, me. I'm the one that had the baby. No, no, no. Mother sat down on a front pew. That just means that Jesus belongs to everybody. Unto all of us a child is born. Now, she sighed, let's start again and... Why didn't they let Mary name her own baby? Imogene demanded. What did that angel do? Just walk up and say, name him Jesus? Yes, Mother said, because she was in a hurry to get finished. But Alice Wendelkin had to open her big mouth. I know what the angel said, Alice piped up. She said, his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. I could have hit her. My God, Imogene said. He'd never get out of the first grade if he had to write all that. There was a big crash at the back of the church as if somebody dropped all the collection plates. But it wasn't the collection plates. It was Mrs. Hopkins, the minister's wife, dropping a whole tray of silverware. I'm sorry, she said. I was just passing by and I thought I'd take a peek. Would you like to sit down and watch the rehearsal? Mother asked. No, Mrs. Hopkins couldn't seem to take her eyes off Imogene. I'd better go check on the applesauce cake. You didn't have to say that, I told Alice. All that about wonderful, everlasting father and all? Why not, Alice said, patting her hair. I thought Imogene wanted to know. By that time, everyone was hot and tired and most of the baby angels had to go to the bathroom. So Mother said we would take a five-minute recess. And then we'll start over, she said, looking sort of hopeless, and go right straight through without stopping, won't we? Well, we never did go right straight through. The five-minute recess was a big mistake because it stretched to 15 minutes and Imogene spent the whole time smoking cigars in one of the Johns in the ladies' room. Then Mrs. Homer McCarthy went to the ladies' room and opened the door and smelled something funny and saw some smoke. And she ran right to the church office and called the fire department. We were singing Angels We Have Heard on High when what we heard was the fire engine pulling up on the lawn of the church with the siren blaring and all the red lights flashing. The firemen hurried in and made us all go outside, and they dragged a big hose in the front door and went looking for a fire to put out. The street was full of baby angels crying and shepherds climbing all over the fire truck and firemen and all the ladies on the potluck committee and neighbors who came to see what was going on and Reverend Hopkins who ran over from the parsonage in his pajamas and his woolly bathrobe. Nobody knew what had happened, including the Herdmans. But I guess they figured that whatever it was, they had done it. So they left. Why in the world did you call the fire department? 
Mother asked Mrs. McCarthy when she finally heard the whole story. Because the ladies' room was full of thick smoke. It couldn't have been, Mother said. You just got excited. Didn't you know it was cigar smoke? Mrs. McCarthy stared at her. No, I didn't. I don't expect to find cigar smoke in the ladies' room of the church. She whirled around and marched back to the kitchen. But by that time, the kitchen was fuller of smoke than the ladies' room, because while everybody was milling around in the street, all the applesauce cake burned up. Of course, the ladies on the potluck committee were mad about that. Mrs. McCarthy was mad, and Alice said her mother would be good and mad when she heard about it. Most of the baby angels' mothers were mad because they couldn't find out what had happened. And somebody said Mrs. Hopkins was mad because Reverend Hopkins was running around the streets in his pajamas. It turned out to be the one great big sinful thing Alice kept hoping for. Mrs. Wendelkin read Alice's notes, got on the telephone that very night and called up everybody she could think of in the Ladies' Aid and the Women's Society. And she called most of the flower committee and all the Sunday school teachers and Reverend Hopkins. And Reverend Hopkins came to see Mother. I can't make head or tail of it, he said. Some people say they set fire to the ladies' room. Some people say they set fire to the kitchen. One lady told me that Imogene threw a flower pot at Ralph. Mrs. Wendelkin says all they do is talk about sex and underwear. That was Hobie Carmichael, Mother said, talking about underwear. And they didn't set fire to anything. The only fire was in the kitchen, where the potluck committee let their applesauce cake burn up. Well, Reverend Hopkins looked unhappy. The whole church is in an uproar. Do you think we should call off the pageant? Certainly not, Mother said. By that time, she was mad too. Why, it's going to be the best Christmas pageant we've ever had. Of all the lies she'd told so far, that was the biggest. But you had to admire her. It was like General Custer saying, bring on the Indians. Maybe so, Reverend Hopkins said. I'm just afraid that no one will come to see it. But he was wrong. Everybody came to see what the herdmans would do.